Thank you, Brother Sutherland. I'm sure this afternoon we don't want a long, drawn-out message, but on an occasion like this, I'm sure there is something from the Word of God that should challenge our hearts, and particularly these candidates and their wives <clears throat> this afternoon. So I want to draw your attention to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, for a passage of Scripture that has challenged me in my own life and ministry and also in the teaching and training of young preachers for the work of the gospel. <clears throat> uh, Romans, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, an apostle or a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom ye also are, call, are the call of Jesus Christ. I think this afternoon that leadership is the greatest need of the church when we, when we speak on the human level. Now, last night we were talking about revival. We were talking about the manifestation and the revelation of God, the, super, the supernatural God, and that is true from God's standpoint. That is, when we're talking about the supernatural, God is the only answer. But God works through man. In fact, in this very passage of Scripture, we have here a revelation of the fact, once again an emphasis upon the fact of the manhood of Jesus Christ. Notice here he said that he was revealed according to the flesh. And it is always a danger when we begin to isolate the supernatural working of God from this flesh life of ours. And I'm not using that in the carnal sense. I'm simply saying in the human. There is always the tendency to develop a super spirituality that isolates God from life and from the world in which we live. But the scriptures are diligent to warn us and to, and to guide us around this detour which leads into mysticism upon which faith is wrecked if we ever isolate the gospel of Jesus Christ from the manhood of Christ and therefore from this, the life of God in human flesh. There is no greater seal upon the ordination of a man or a woman for the gospel of Jesus Christ than the realization that God became flesh and dwelt among us and that therefore in order for the gospel to be preached to this age, it must become flesh. And here these candidates that sit before us today are to be a revelation in the flesh of the supernatural working of God. That's what it's about. So leadership, the, this kind of leadership, God indwelling human beings, God indwelling these candidates for ordination, so that wherever they go, God will go. And I say that kind of leadership is the greatest need of the church today. Yes, we need buildings. I suppose some of you need, are aware of the need of buildings. We need programs. I think that there is a need for organization and for programs. But men are God's method. And I'm not using that over against uh, men, uh, men and women. I'm just saying that human beings indwelt by the Spirit of God are God's method. And more than we need buildings and more than we need money and more than we need programs, we need men and women filled with the Holy Ghost in whom God dwells to manifest God to the world today. And so this is a solemn occasion to recognize that God himself has laid his hand upon these young men and their wives to lead his church. And they will lead that church either to victory or defeat, depending upon how they grasp the provisions made of God for their apostleship in the gospel.
Oh, what a solemn thing. In fact, it is so solemn that as Luther prepared himself to become ordained uh, for the ministry, he trembled and almost fainted with a realization that God was to indwell him and that God was to manifest himself through him and that the church would either succeed and go forward or fail in defeat depending upon how he availed himself of that grace of God. Now, I want to say to you this afternoon that more than any other one thing, the success of the church will depend on you. The success of the church is to a great extent, or the church is to a great extent, the length and shadow of its leaders. And I'm speaking now of the local church. The church is to a great extent the length and shadows of its pastor. And that church, the, one, uh, the same church, can either succeed or fail depending upon the kind of leadership that it has. And what a solemn responsibility that places upon us. And so with this solemn responsibility before us, I would like to remind you of four things that your call includes based upon this scripture here. Your call, first of all, you are called to servanthood. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. A call to servanthood. Philippians 2, 7 says that Jesus took upon him the form of a servant. And Hebrews 3, 5 says that he was faithful in all his house as a servant. One of the unique things about leadership in the church of Jesus Christ is that it is a leadership by serving. We gain our leadership by serving. <clears throat> and you will not be uh, a leader simply because you walk into the church as an appointed pastor. You'll have to earn your leadership. And you earn your leadership in two primary ways. One, by loving your people as God loved the church. And second, you will earn your leadership by proving your ability to lead. Proving your ability to lead. I believe that a church ought to give the pastor the reverence and the respect that is due and to uh, follow. But the pastor also has a responsibility to demonstrate the grace of God in his ability to lead the people. And so it's a... And we gain that through serving the people. If you'll allow a little, <clears throat> uh, a little homespun illustration here, I have heard, I suppose, most of my life, the the little uh, proverb used: "Build a better mousetrap, and the world will beat a path to your door." But I saw an illustration of that several weeks ago when I was clipping some things from Time Magazine and lo and behold, there was an article in there about a man who had indeed built a better mousetrap. In fact, he built, he had studied mice. He had been a, a custodian of a school, I believe it was, and he had seen plenty of mice. And he, instead of just killing them, he had observed their habits. And he built a mousetrap that has the experts mystified. You don't need to put any meat in it. You don't need to put any cheese in it, no bait, whatever. They just enter the mousetrap. And they enter this little tunnel, and then they fall down through a trap door, and a little paddle on a spring flips it to one side, closes the trap door, and some of those traps have caught as many as a dozen to 15 mice at one time. They're still alive, so you can turn them loose on your neighbors if you want to, or do some, anything that you want to with them. <clears throat> but it has the experts mystified as to why in the world those mice enter that little trap, that trap. And it is so successful till the company doesn't even advertise. You don't see their advertisement. But they're so successful that mainly large companies, granaries and so on, buy them. They're a little expensive. And so uh, uh, granaries and other uh, uh, larger companies buy these mouse traps and they don't bother to advertise it. Now it's a a uh, multi-million dollar business. Why? They serve the public. They built a mousetrap that would do the job. And I want to say to you that our leadership is a leadership of service. It's a leadership of service. We lead by serving, not by demanding, I'm your pastor, you show me respect, you do what I say, 
No, by coming in and loving your people and so serving your people. Till, and I have seen churches that would almost lay down and die for their pastor. Why, they loved him. Because he loved them. And because he had served them, they're willing to serve him. That is serve in the right way. That is to follow. And so we are called to a leadership of servant. As a servant, you are, first of all, under authority of Christ. Notice here Paul said a servant of Jesus Christ. And this servant servanthood is opposed to the independence of this day. I am speaking of the attitude of independence. I don't care what the other fellow says. I don't care what he thinks. I'm going to run my own show. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do this. I this and I that. And the self-autonomy of this age as opposed to the submission. First of all, to Jesus Christ. And I want to remind you that that submission to Jesus Christ also involves a submission to one another. And fellas, that's not only your wife submitting to you, that's your submitting to one another. In fact, Paul makes it very strong in the same book in which he talks about wives submitting themselves to the husband. He says, you submit yourselves to one another. And you know that's difficult to do. I don't believe in independence in the sense of an independent spirit. An independent spirit. Friends, I am sub I'm under subjection, first of all, to Jesus Christ. And secondly, I'm in subjection to the church of Jesus Christ. Wesley believed this so strongly till he even submitted the issue of his marriage to his brethren. See what they thought about it. And they agreed not to get married unless all agreed that it was the thing to do. Now, I'm not necessarily recommending you go that far, uh, though I do believe that's the way it should be in the home, that is, you submit it to your parents. But, but uh, in the church of Jesus Christ, we are submitted one to another. And the first time, now, now I know we're an independent bunch of, holiness people are an independent bunch of people. Uh, by our very nature, our strong convictions make us independent. I'm going to believe what I believe and I'm going to stand for what I believe regardless of what anybody else. Well, there's a sense in which that's true where we have got to stand for truth. But it's so easy to get basic biblical truth confused with our opinions and our desires. And if we don't learn the secret and the biblical admonition of submission, we're going to continue to have strife and division among ourselves. I'm not, I'm not intimating that there is among you. I am not aware of any. So if there is, just keep it under the cover and I'll not know anything about it. I'm not talking about that. But all across the country, there is such an animal around called division. And it springs primarily from this independent attitude, I'm going to have my way. Now, we don't say it that way. We say, I'm going to stand for truth. But it's actually saying, I'm going to stand, I'm going to do my own thing. <clears throat> there is a grave grave responsibility along this line. I believe this works in the conference, Brother Sutherland. You ought to uh, uh, say amen to this. But I believe there is a real sense in which if we're united together in a conference, there's a real sense in which we are submitted to one another. I have seen this at work. It's been my privilege to be associated at Hope Sound for a while. And as is true everywhere, there are differences of opinion. And there are people from, oh, nearly every state in the Union, a good part of the different states. And when you get that many people from this, that many different parts of the country together, you've got a lot of different opinions among the people and also among the leadership. And I have seen meetings, and Brother Southern and I learned a lesson. And gentlemen, wives, I have learned one lesson that I'll be forever grateful. I have seen great men and women, I mean of, the, mo the, of the, the most deeply spiritual men and women that I believe walk 
the top side of God's earth. Differ in opinion. And I saw with my eyes the difference between those who end up in division and those who end up by going from faith to faith and grace to grace and glory to glory. And it is in the realization that while we must be faithful in witnessing to the light God has given us, but when other brethren and sisters, praying brothers and sisters, say we do not see it like that, let's submit it again to God. They say, I have now done my witness. I have been faithful. And now I submit to the will of the church. And that's the reason in 33 years there's never been a split in the vision. If we do not learn this secret, we will continue to build scaffolds rather than churches. Do you realize that's basically what we're doing across the country? We're building the scaffolding, hoping to get the church built and doing very little building of the church of Jesus Christ. Constantly building again the scaffolding rather than the church. So I say to you, he said he is a servant of Jesus Christ. There's much that needs to be said along this line that we could say, but I must hurry on. <clears throat> As a servant, I said you're under authority of Christ. Oh, it's a privilege to belong to Christ because he is all wise. He is all powerful. He is all loving. He is all caring. And therefore, we can submit our life and our ministry to him with a full realization. He will not let it go. And we're part of his great kingdom. I remember hearing about a businessman and a preacher. A preacher, in fact, I heard the preacher who this happened to was riding on the plane and he sat down by a businessman. And this businessman was a representative from a very large, prestigious company. And as businessmen will do, he began to talk about his company and he said, ours is the largest company in this state. And he said, ours is the oldest company in this state. And he said, we have the best prospects for success and we offer the best benefits. And he was going on and on. And the preacher said, well, I serve the largest company in the world. And it's the oldest. And he said, it has the best prospects for success. And he said, it offers the best benefits. <laughs> Eternal benefits. Listen, you don't need to feel sorry for me. I'm glad that I'm part of the kingdom of God that is forever and forever. And in a new sense, not that you haven't been before, but in a new sense, you're entering into a special relationship as a called apostle of Jesus Christ to represent him to this world. And I'm glad for the privilege God has given you. The, not only as a servant are you under authority, but you own nothing. The word here is doulos, the same word as is used for a slave. Paul, the slave of Jesus Christ. That's what you call him. And this isn't popular either, even among holiness people. But I believe if we ever accomplish what God wants us to accomplish, we must learn the secret of owning nothing. Did you realize that's a blessed rest and peace when we come to the place where we recognize we own nothing? If the house burns down, it's God's house. <laughs> He's responsible. That's right. <laughs> Vance Havner said a, a, a Christian is a strange and difficult creature to deal with. The devil comes along and says, if you serve me, I'll give you everything. And the Christian says to him, sorry, Mr. Devil, I already own everything in Christ. I have all things in Christ. Well, the devil says, if you don't serve me, I'll take everything from you. And the Christian says, Sorry, Mr. Devil, but I lost and gave up everything when I took Christ. Well, he says, I'll kill you if you don't serve me. Sorry, Mr. Devil, I died. 
in Christ. That's a hard fellow to deal with. You can't win against a fellow like that. And that's the secret of owning nothing, where everything is submitted, and every once in a while God tests my surrender along that line. Every once in a while, when the things become a little, I become a little bit too attached. Sometimes it's such a trifling thing. And I'm amazed at how little trifling things can cling to us. And every once in a while, God challenges my heart. Are you really loose from the things of this world? I mean really loose. So that if everything was gone, you could look up and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise His name. Can you say that? From your heart, everything belongs to Him. And if everything is gone, I roomed in school while I, in seminary with a uh, Korean man who was older than I who had lost everything when the North Korean communists took over North Korea. His wife and his two daughters, for 13 years, he had not heard a word from them. And as far as he knew, he did not have a living relative. I hope to see him the latter part of the summer. Not a living relative. But he had surrendered to Jesus Christ and he had all things in him. I know that sounds difficult to the world, but oh dear friends, when we have an eternal kingdom, our possessions are eternal because they're in him. And when we give up temporal possessions, we gain eternal possessions. Bless his holy name. Praise the Lord. And then not only are you called <coughs> to servanthood, but you are called to the apostleship of the gospel. Now, the word apostle means a commissioned one or a delegated one or a representative. It, it is a, it's, uh, can be used in a narrow sense and a broad sense. In the narrow sense, it meant only the 12 apostles. But the word is broader than that. And in a real sense, we are called to be apostles. In the sense <clears throat> that we are called to be witnesses, to be delegates, to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And in a special sense, a, an apostle is one who carries the good news to someone for the first time. Basically the same thing as a missionary. That is a missionary, a pioneer missionary, who goes and opens up the gospel for the first time. For this is what the 12 disciples did, you see. This is one of the reasons they were called apostles. They were the first. And in a real sense, you are called to apostleship. You are called to apostleship in the sense that you are called to be an ambassador of God. You are to be the model of what God wants to do for a man or woman in this world. To look at you and see that's what God can do. I want to be like that individual because they remind me of Jesus Christ. An ambassador, a delegate, a representative. But not only that, to present the gospel for the first time people. Oh, you say not in this country. If I were called to uh, some mission field, yes, that would be true. Oh, no, dear friends. There are multitudes all around this country that have never heard a clear-cut, the clear-cut gospel and the claim of Jesus Christ. on the, And some of them are right down the street from where we live. We're called to be an apostle. And it's an apostleship, apostle of the gospel. A, an apostle of the gospel. Now, I, I recognize I can't go into all of this, but he said it was the gospel that was promised by the prophets. Oh, this isn't something new. I was telling Brother Sutherland at the lunch table, reminding him I'd forgotten that I'd mentioned it before, but I said, you pilgrims have the wrong name. A pilgrim is one who goes to a holy place and returns. And I don't plan to return. <laughs> I'm headed for another country and I don't plan to come back. Now, an immigrant is one who goes to live. So you need to change your name to the holy immigrants or something. <laughs> <laughs> and this gospel is not a gospel that you pilgrims thought of or that we thought up down at Hope Sound, or that the Covenants, or the Bible Missionary, or somebody else, or the Westlands thought of. 
No, this was promised by the apostles, by the prophets. For ages it has been, it has been the, it has been the mystery of the ages now revealed to us, and we have the privilege of running throughout all the earth and saying, the secret has been revealed. You can be a part of the kingdom of God. That's what we're called to do. Oh, don't lose the thrill of the gospel. Don't get so involved in church. I, I'm going to confess some of the advice I give some of our preacher boys there. And I don't know. Uh, but here's the advice. I said, don't get mixed up in all of the problems of the conference. Let Brother Sutherland take care of them. Let the council take care of them. And you stick to the job that has been given you to do in your local church and get the job done. If we're not careful, we'll get so involved with our little problems till we forget the thrill of presenting this glorious gospel to somebody new. Praise the Lord. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ promised by the prophets and it is regarding his son who descended of David in the flesh and it was declared to be the son of God by the spirit of holiness. Oh, yes. This same gospel that you preached is the same gospel that came upon, that is, it is the gospel about Jesus Christ who was raised in mighty power from the dead by the Spirit of holiness. And this Spirit of holiness is what indwells you today if you are filled with the Spirit of God. And it is this Spirit of holiness that causes us to preach holiness unto the Lord not just as long as it's convenient or as long as the manual says it, but because we have been called of God to preach it. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit of holiness that called us to preach holiness to this age and to this generation. Now, I want to give you some practical advice. I believe if you are called of God to preach the gospel, I don't believe, I believe if you are called of God and recognize what that calling implies, you will never, never hang around conference whining for a church. You didn't expect me to say that, did you? But I've been around too many conferences where that takes place. They didn't give me a church. They didn't give me a church. I don't have any place to preach. Oh, grow up. Samuel Chadwick said, if they don't pay me to preach, I'll pay to preach. If you've been called of God, you'll find a place to preach. And if the seal of God's approval is upon your calling, you will have fruit and people will want you to come and preach. And if they don't give you a church and nobody wants you, then get down on your knees and find out whether you're called. And if you're called, then get busy and do something until somebody will want you. Now, that's the secret formula for success. I just spilled the beans. Listen, I believe that. Now, I'm not trying to be unkind. There are some that are called to one ministry and some another, and maybe God has not called everybody to pastor a church or be an evangelist. I'm in no way implying that everybody should be a Charles G. Finney or a uh, George Whitfield or a Wesley or a Luther or even a James Upham. We're not all called to do the same thing. But find your calling and then do it and quit whining. That so-and-so won't let me do things or the conference this or the conference that. Oh, dear friends, if we know what God has called us to do, we don't need anybody to prepare the way before us. I, it helps to have that. I don't mean that we should despise that. But get busy and do what God has called you to do. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we're called not only to be servants. We're called not only to be apostles, but we're called to receive grace. And I like this. He said, called by whom we have received grace and apostleship. Now, what in the world is grace and how does it apply to being called to the gospel? It's important. Grace, we hear it normally defined as unmerited favor, and that's good, but I've never been able fully to get a hold of it. Let me suggest to you at least part of the meaning of the word grace. 
grace is the divine implantation of desire, of holy desire. Now think about that for a little bit. Do you know why you, why you do what you do? It's because you want to do it. I was, I was coming through uh, part of Florida the other day, and uh, I was thinking of all of the needs that, you know, of the church and of the, of the work of God. <clears throat> and I came by one of those uh, places where they where they beach their boats, and there were boats, it seemed, by the hundreds. I suppose it was by the dozens, but it looked by the hundreds. And I mean big boats. I mean expensive boats. And boats are terribly expensive. I mean a little boat. I'm talking about motorboat, power with powerful motors and so on, run $5,000, and they run on up to $250,000. If you'd have gone to one of those owners and said, could you spare $1,000 for mission? Oh, no, I don't have it. I don't have any money for mission. Why, no. Well, where'd you get the money for that boat? Oh, I wanted that boat. Did you know we get what we want? We do what we want. Do you know the reason we're not any more spiritual than we are is because we don't want to be? Do you know why we're not more active in winning the loss to Jesus? Because we don't really want to. Grace is the implantation. God implanting in the human heart the desire, of, or that is a holy desire. The desire to pray. The desire to win souls. And if you desire it, you'll do it. And that desire comes from God. And that's what Paul was talking about. He said, by whom we have received grace. Paul said, it, he just, he used strong language. Like he was burning up to get to Rome to preach the gospel. Why? He had such passionate desire to get to Rome to preach the gospel. You couldn't have stopped Paul with a shipwreck. <laughs> they didn't. You couldn't have stopped Paul with beatings. They didn't. Why? He had a desire to get there. And the more you pray, the more desire you will have to pray. And you say, oh, I ought to go, I ought to go speak to so-and-so about their soul. I just seem like I have a special desire. Then do it. Do it. And the desire will increase. How do we get more grace from God? By using the grace we have. My father used to tell about a, an evangelist, an old gruff evangelist down in the south, and a fellow went to him and said, Brother, how do I receive more faith? He said, use what you've got. And that's right. Do you know how to receive the grace of God for your work? Use what you have. Every, every flickering desire in your soul for deeper spiritual things Cultivate it, fan it, use it, do something about it, and you'll find that flickering flame growing to a greater passionate desire after God as we use what the grace that God has already given us. I must hurry now in closing, and the final thing, we are called to win souls. Notice in verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, that is said a little awkward there. It simply means that we may win to the faith, to the obedience of the faith, those from the heathen world. That's our calling. Wesley said, you have nothing to do but to win souls. That was his commission to the preachers. You have nothing to do but to win souls. Paul said of Jesus, he came for this purpose, to save sinners. That was his coming. Oh, dear friends, the church has gotten busy in doing everything but the most important thing. I heard of a church where a fellow came in to help them try to establish some sort of visitation or witnessing program. It was a large church, and they studied the church schedule and program for a week trying to find some place to put in a soul-winning program and said they finally came to the conclusion they didn't have any time for it. And the youth program and the women's missionary society and the men's fellowship and this group and that group and this committee and that committee and this board and that board and the whole business we claim is to win souls. And basically we're running around in circles and never getting at the task. 
We need organization, but friends, the organization that runs around the primary purpose is missing God's calling. The purpose of the church is to win the law. Paul said, I'm called to win to the obedience of the faith those that are lost in the heathen world around us. Then he said, after his mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost, he said, there were times when I grew cold and I would have to retreat sometimes for a half a day, sometimes a day, and pray until that anointing came back on my life. Oh, how important that is. And I trust that God's grace may rest upon you in such power and in such a holy anointing that you will seek to win the lost. Ordination to the ministry is a high and holy calling. I heard about uh, Lester Pearson who was elected a, um, to, or appointed to some uh, position in the Canadian government. He was appointed as what they call the ministers up there. Uh, to, the, to the, some ministry in the government and he called his mother. His mother had always wanted Lester Pearson to be a preacher of the gospel. And so sort of for fun, he called her and said, well, mother, he said, I'm finally a minister. And she paused a moment. And she said, well, Lester, I'm happy for you even if it is the second-rate kind. Somebody has said, if God has called you to preach the gospel, don't stoop to be a king. And there, this is a high and holy calling that he's given, him, given us. And friends, if we fulfill our task as God has given us the commission to fill it, there will come a day when we will see the fruit of our labors. I believe we'll see some here, but there will come a day when we'll see. William Booth tells about a, a preacher, and pardon me, not a preacher, but a businessman who was traveling across the Atlantic Ocean on a steamer in the early days of steamship travel. And the steamer somehow ran into difficulty and began to sink. They were near shore, and the businessman had, a, had his money with him. And, of course, in those days, they did not have paper money. They had uh, silver and gold, and so it was heavy, and he had it in a bag. And as the steamer started going down, people were grabbing life preservers and jumping over and getting into the boat. And the shore was not too far away, but a little boy about 12 years old came up to the man and said, Oh, mister, would you save me? I can't swim. Would you save me? And the man looked at his bag of gold, and he looked at the little boy, and he tossed his bag of gold over the ship, grabbed the little boy, jumped into the water, and swam and swam and swam till he finally reached the shore. And the little fellow looked at him and said, Oh, mister, I'm so glad you saved me. And dear friends, we've been called in this earthly journey. Here and there are people that are in need of God, and there's nobody to save them. And you and I are called to rescue the dying, to save the lost. And dear friends, if we get our eyes on gold, or get our eyes on pleasures, or get our eyes on other things. Oh, what a tragedy it's going to be. But if we're true to the gospel on the other shore, there are going to be those that will say, Oh, well, I'm so glad you were faithful to my soul. And to the other brethren and the wives here, I'm so glad you ever came my way. I'm so glad. Let's be faithful. Let's be true. Amen. It is your sincere conviction that you have been called of God to the ministry? Yes, sir. Are you persuaded that the Holy Scriptures contain all doctrines required of necessity for eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. And are you determined out of the Holy Scriptures to instruct the people committed to your charge? and to teach nothing as required of necessity to salvation 
but that which you shall be persuaded may be concluded and proved by the scriptures. Yes. Do you cordially accept the, the articles of faith of the Pilgrim Holiness Church and agree to declare and defend them? Yes. Will you then give your faithful diligence always so to minister the doctrines, sacraments, and disciplines of Christ as the Lord hath commanded you? Will you be diligent in prayers, in reading the Holy Scriptures, and such studies as help to be knowledgeable of the same? Will you be diligent to frame and fashion yourself and your family according to the doctrine of Christ and to make yourself and them as much as in you lieth wholesome examples and patterns to the flock of Christ. Will you maintain and set forth as much as lieth in you quietness, peace, and love among all Christian people and especially among those who are or, or may be committed to your charge? Will you here and now pledge yourself to be loyal, obedient under God, in cooperation with the duly elected and consecrated officers of the church? Yes, sir. I'd like you to kneel now and make room for your wives also to uh, kneel with you. I don't think uh, we can emphasize enough um, this afternoon the um, responsibility that we have not only as ministers to our flock but our responsibility that we have as uh, husbands to our wives and to set an example and we certainly are a team uh, working together in this great harvest field. I would like for Brother Rains to uh, come and lead us in prayer as we pray with Brother David West here. Hey, brethren, let's lay our hands. Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, we come to thee, Lord, and be thankful Amen. for thy love and thy mercy <laughs> and the all wisdom of God. Amen. Brother Thank West you. here, Father, we pray we that thou also do overshadow Lord, Brother West, dear Jesus, and put thy give him thine Amen. anointing, dear Father. Oh, Praise God, God, the power is all of us. Be your Lord. Let thy, thy mighty spirit upon him and guide him and direct Let him. Let him be Lord as a minister of God. In the time of difficulty and decision, Lord, I'll be of the human understanding. Free Give him the guidance of spiritual, the Lord, of God. and direct him in every decision, Amen. every mind. Praise oh, God. God. We'll give him the glory, the praise. Help him, Lord, and let him be true. Oh, Father, for thy divine presence in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. We ask you, Jesus, in Jesus' name, to thy glory, Help him and baptize him, Father. Amen. And get him again with thine anointing, Father. In the name of Jesus, let it be so. And we'll give you the glory, the glory of God. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise the Lord. Brother David West, take thou authority to preach the word of God, to administer the sacraments, and perform all the duties of an ordained minister in the church of God. In the name of God the Father, and of God the Son, and God the blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'd like for Brother Gray to pray with us or lead us in prayer as we lay our hands upon Brother Bickle here. Our precious Heavenly Father, we Amen. thank thee this afternoon for a Amen. sense of thy divine Praise love God that is here in yes, this service. Lord. We thank thee, Lord, for thy hand, for thy ministering touch unto thy soul. word. Thou hast come unto God. the work of Christ and no, Amen. Caring for the church him, oh God. and the people that thou hast come the principles of truth, Lord, the, the ministry of the gospel of Amen. Christ faithfully. 
by Jesus' blessed name, praise God, and unto those that are anointed and praying, we pray just now this afternoon, that brother and sister of the Lord, thy spirit is our rest of the Lord, they shall enjoy power, and thy glory, and the Holy Ghost be shaken to be a firebrand for God, amen, and to the praise of prayer, In the name of Jesus. We pray that thou shall help them to be an example and a pattern for the gospel of Christ. Be faithful unto the task. Amen. That thou hast called them to. Oh, Amen. We pray that thy riches bless God. Shall rest upon them. Amen. Amen. And may they be known as examples of the word of God. And Praise ministers God. of thy truth in the name of the Father, Amen. in the name of the Son, and Amen. in the name of the blessed Holy Amen. Ghost. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 Brother Terry Bickle, take thou authority to preach the word of God, to administer the sacraments and perform all the duties of an ordained minister. Praise in the church of God, in the name of God the Father, and God the Son, <laughs> and God the blessed Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Brethren, let's lay our hands on the beachers. Amen. Our loving Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise Thee this afternoon for the providential arrangement of Thy plan and purpose in the lives of Thy people. And our Heavenly Father, as we lay our hands upon Brother Beecher this afternoon, we want to thank You for the providence of God that's made it possible that he be at this place. We thank you, Lord, that at an early age thou didst lay your hand upon his life and give him a desire to serve thee and to be one of thine own. Lord, thou hast brought him through the fire and the flood and through the great peril and waters and, and the problems, and yet he's finished the course, and we appreciate thy faithfulness in his life. Our Father, we ask of thee that thou would give him that authority, give him that unction of the Holy Ghost. Help him, Father, to be a pastor and a preacher, an oracle of God, to declare the plan and purpose of God in surety and in truth and the old-fashioned rugged gospel truth in this day. We pray that thou would give him that particular and peculiar anointing of heaven. May the dew of the Holy Ghost rest upon his soul. May he rightly divide the word of truth. May the prince of hell be defeated. And the power of God rest upon he and his wife and family. Yes. Encourage him and his church wherever his feet shall trod. May the blessing of God be upon him, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we commit him to thy keeping and thy care. For the glory of God. Amen. And amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. I'd like for the candidates and their wives uh, to stand and face this congregation. I'd like for the congregation to stand. I'd like for our brother to get to that song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. I'd like the brethren of the ordination. Number 78.
Amen. Brother Beecher, take thou authority to preach the word of God, to administer the sacraments, and to perform all the duties of an ordained minister in the church of God. In the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen.